Good evening and welcome to the Shrewsbury Historical Society. This is our October 2020 presentation. And before we begin, we'd like to remind everyone that we've also started our second month into the year and it is due time. So if you could pay your dues, that would be wonderful. I have to send my check in this month. <clears throat> Each year as part of the outreach to the community, the Shrewsbury Historical Society presents two special awards. The Shrewsbury History Award is given to a person who shows a record of outstanding leadership, service and interest in the history of the town. The Shrewsbury History Award was presented to David Prince who redesigned the Shrewsbury Historical Society website. David is on our board, he's a great member. Thank you very much, David. <clears throat> The society also honors an individual or organization that complete, uh, completes a restoration that is an enduring example of Shrewsbury's historic architecture. The Shrewsbury Historical Society Restoration and Preservation Award was presented to Paul and Mame Little for their recent restoration of the Philo Slocum House on Prospect Street. Congratulations to these two recipients for their contributions to the community. Next is our curator's report. Tonight, Christine Gustafson will report. Hi, I'm Chris Gustafson, Vice President. Curator Linda Davis reported that the Society received the donation of photographs and documents from the family of Maurice Cook of Cook Greenhouses on Floral Street. We also received an envelope dated 1901 with the name Shrewsbury Carriage Company that was donated from the Gravestone Girls. Linda also assisted with some genealogical research at the Society. Okay, thank you very much. Next is our treasurer's report. Christine Gustafson will report. Treasurer Ann Folwin reported that our expenses have been paid, including rent, lawn services, and monthly program fee. The oil burner has been cleaned. We also have a current certificate of insurance, and the society made a donation to light the common. Thank you to those members who have renewed their memberships and paid their $10 in dues. Special thanks to those who also made additional donations to the society. New members are always welcome. Membership forms are available on the Society website. Thank you very much. Okay, tonight's presentation for the Shrewsbury Historical Society is a primer on early lighting devices by Tom Kelleher and uh, virtual program and tape rebroadcast Shrewsbury Cable Channels 28 and 3328. About the presentation, the 45 minute PowerPoint presentation sheds light on some basics about candles, whale oil, and other early lamp fuels and lamp designs it is an expansion on an article written by Tom Kelleher for Early American Life. Uh, Tom Kelleher is one of our uh, featured performers. He's, uh, he's always at the Shrewsbury uh, Historical Society. He's the uh, historian and curator of mechanical arts at Old Sturbridge Village in Sturbridge, Mass. And he has, uh, worn many hats literally, figuratively and literally for over 30 years. He regularly teaches and demonstrates at museums and historical societies across the country. Tom holds a master's degree in history from the University of Connecticut and he writes for a variety of magazines and journals. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for having me. It's always fun to uh, speak at the Shrewsbury Historical Society. Um, well, let me get into my PowerPoint. The subject of um, early lighting devices is something that could fill volumes, has filled volumes. So in a short talk tonight, I certainly won't get to everything, but hopefully we'll get a few things um, that will be of interest. Of course, I work at Old Sturbridge Village and uh, many of you of course have probably been there. Um, Old Sturbridge Village actually uh, has a part of its start to um, lighting collections. Our principal founder, the gentleman with the fedora, Albert Bachelor Wells um, was a member of the Rushlight Club, which is a long-standing, still in existence, uh, society of collectors of early lighting. And another member was the younger man uh, on the lower right, that's Malcolm Watkins, who was our first curator. And actually they met at a um, meeting of the Rushlight Club that Mr. Wells hosted at his house. And Malcolm Watkins was a recent college graduate looking for a job. And there were no museum studies programs back then, 
So Malcolm kind of liked antiques and he inherited a lighting early lighting collection from his grandfather and so thought he'd get in touch with Mr. Wells to see if he would, uh, would hire him. And A.B. Wells was a kind of a tough businessman. Uh, Malcolm described him once as a cartoon caricature of a capitalist industrialist, which I think he looks like in this picture, kind of like a Daddy Warbucks character. But anyway, he was a maniacal antique collector. He um, had filled his house, which still stands on 160, 176 Main Street in Southridge, Massachusetts. Um, 42 rooms of this mansion, which is much larger than picture shows, a floor to ceiling with antiques that he collected over about 10 years from the mid 1920s to the mid 1930s. Here's a couple of the rooms um, down the hall, as like I said, literally filled floor to ceiling. And you can see in these pictures, a lot of lighting devices that he collected. Um, yeah, he, he, he said uh, that, that nothing gave him more pleasure than buying antiques. And there's another room full of uh, um, his antiques, including a lot of his oil lamps. Anyway, um, there's Malcolm Watkins later in life when he went on to a very long and successful career after our first year at Old Sturbridge Village at the Smithsonian Institution, where he really pioneered the, the building of um, historical rooms there, which as you can see, continued to furnish with early lighting devices. And of course, lighting has been a feature of Old Sturbridge Village. Every winter now, we um, demonstrate candle making. Back when the museum first opened, and for many decades, they would try to demonstrate candle making um, all year round, which doesn't really work well. You're basically dipping wicks into hot fat and then in summer all the fat drips off and people can't understand what you're doing. But nonetheless, back in the, in the 40s, 50s, into the 60s, people did that every day because that was what they thought happened in early America. Anyway, we're a little better about that now, but moving on. Um, here's a little quiz, which is more out of place in this nice early American um, kitchen? Uh, is it is it the lamp on the left or the lamp on the right? I'll let you think for yourself. I know we can't uh, have dialogue here, but um, I would point out that uh, Edison's electric lamp was patented earlier than um, this hot hot excuse me cold blast uh, kerosene lantern. Um, so many modern people might think, well, of course the electric light is more recent, but not really. Anyway, anyway, I'm not going to talk much about electric light here. Um, we'll leave Edison out of the conversation this evening beyond this. Um, but one thing I'll start at the beginning in that, in that there's more light than many of we moderns uh, really initially recognize. Um, given time, our eyes naturally adjust to lower lighting levels. Many of us in the 21st century are rarely exposed to lack of artificial light in one way or another. Um, but given enough uh, darkness, our eyes can make do with very low levels of light. Uh, it's almost very surprising. So when I was a boy, um, as a boy scout, my scout master was Native American, um, purposely made us like go in the dark for like an hour and then go on a night hike without flashlights. And it was amazing how much we could see. Um, and early, early people realized that, um, and they tried to take advantage of what little light there was. Uh, of course, many, Early American rooms had, and modern rooms have white ceilings, um, polished surfaces, um, white walls that that make the most of what little available light there is and reflect it, and um, make it much easier to get around in very dim conditions. Um, but of course, people for millennia have added to that with fire. Um, of course, one of the earliest bits of fire is an iron basket filled with burning bits of wood. Um, called cressets. You know, if you ever saw monster movies, there's often these iron baskets burning on the walls of the castles that, uh, that, that Frankenstein or Dracula are going up and down. Um, and so cressets uh, have been around for a very, very long time. Oftentimes you'd burn uh, pitchier woods that have brighter flames in those, things like, um, like pitch pine that uh, give off a lot more light, a little less heat, but a lot more light, which in this case is what you're looking for. And of course, the open fireplace has been legion, or legend, I should say, um, for, for uh, artificial light for a long time. We've all heard the famous story of Abraham Lincoln uh, studying by, by the uh, fireplace. Um, but at Old Sturbridge Village, we do a program, uh, not this fall because of the pandemic, but most falls called um, 
uh, evening of illumination. Quite frankly, we should call it evening of lack of illumination. What we do is we do a tour through um, eight or 10 of our buildings with 19th, early 19th century light levels. And some buildings are just lit by the open hearth. And uh, it's amazing how much light does come off just uh, uh, open a hearth or just a single candle in the middle of a room. Um, but anyway, uh, of course, there's a lot of charm and ambiance as well as light associated with an open hearth. But also when the weather's cold is pleasant for warming the bones as well. Of course, most early American homes did not have central heating and did not have insulation. When you were cold, you got near the fire, not only for light, but for warmth. Um, and that's borne out by early American illustrations um, with a family gathered around the hearth. Um, something that our electric light allows us to disperse into our own little um, domains in modern homes. But early, early homes, people tended to crowd together around the lighting sources, including the open hearth, this little girl reading by the open hearth while her mother spins um, and the cat naps, but that's what cats do. Um, <laughs> and this, this one where we've got two sources of light. You've got a candle in the center of a table um, with uh, a little romantic couple and uh, people who need the light are near it. People who don't need the light are enjoying the light of the fireplace or just enjoying the dimmer light around the room. Of course, daylight is the best light and people took advantage of that. Very often for fine work, uh, women would do their sewing in the daylight, save less precise work like knitting um, for the dimmer light of, of um, nighttime and artificial light. But in fact, the synonym for windows were lights. Um, so you'd go toward the light, go towards the window and very often move around the house as the, the sun moves. Of course, the sun doesn't move, the earth moves, but as the light comes in different windows in the south, east and west sides of the house, um, taking advantage of natural light for the fine work um, of sewing. And so that was very common. Of course, in winter you have um, fewer hours of daylight as the sun is lower in the sky and less intense, but of course with snow on the ground, it reflects light back. So winter light can be very, very bright, at least in daytime. Um, however, when it gets beyond windows and the open hearths, you have to turn to something more. And if you're furnishing a historic home as a, as a museum curator, as I do, as my colleagues often do, um, like I started with, with the uh, picture of the cold blast kerosene lantern and the electric light bulb, we really have to do our homework. So you don't put, you, you can go to a lot of historic homes um, and historic house museums and see very anachronistic um, light sources around the place. Um, and there was a plethora of different light styles available. And there's a plethora of, um, of, of good books that can advise you for a time and place of what's appropriate. Um, so roughly chronologically, I'm going to go through a few basic kind of early lamps. Um, one was, of course, the grease lamp or the oil lamp, um, also called a crucie lamp. Um, basically just a dish with a little spout that can hold a bit of organic matter, a bit of rag, a wick, um, a bit of cattail, stalk, anything that will wick um, hot oil, hot fat, hot grease towards a flame. Uh, and the flame does, of course, with wicks, as we know from candles, do tend to draw the, um, the heated fuel towards the flame to be burned. And of course, these kind of lamps go back thousands and thousands of years. These are styles in, in ceramics and clay, baked clay and bronze from the ancient world. Um, but, you know, not many American homes or American historic sites really depict ancient Rome or ancient Greece or Byzantium or other of the classic culture, excuse me. Of course, my favorite style lamp comes with three wishes, um, much better lamp this way. Um, but this is a little more American. Here's a grease lamp from um, the early 1800s uh, made out of stoneware in Kentucky. Very often by the 19th century, grease lamps do tend to be confined to the frontier and the poorest of homes, but I'll get into that a little more. But the but the um, the oil lamp, the classic um, genie lamp, if you will, um, remains a, a symbol today of the nursing profession. The um, the stylistic person depicted on the left and the real person in the photograph on the right is the famous uh, British nurse Florence Nightingale, 
um, made famous by her uh, ministrations to the soldiers in the Crimean War in the 1850s. Um, but the nurse's lamp remains a symbol of the nursing profession today. Um, among my other uh, uh, qualifications, I'm a registered nurse. And when you finish nursing school, there's a ceremony where you're pinned and you're pinned with a little nurse pin. And there's a nurse pin on the right. Um, the symbolic of the of the the nurse lamp that Florence Nightingale and her companions would um, check on the patients in in the in the night. Anyway, so back to oil lamps. They they come in various styles. The one on the upper on the top is um, one that can actually hold four wicks and produce a fair amount of light. Um, they come in many many materials. Um, the two on the the one on the left and the one on the upper right, of course, are just wrought iron. Um, the one on the left is a double lamp. The lower one is not so much a, uh, for a wick, but to catch the drippings of the upper one to make less of a mess because grease lamps are messy things. One reason why they did tend to be confined to the frontier by the, by the 19th century, certainly. But there came in nicer materials besides the stoneware I showed earlier, pewter as well. Um, but an improvement was made in the 1700s um, that in America, we tend to call it Betty lamp. It's actually a corruption of the German word besser, which means better. It's a better lamp than the old Crucy lamp um, in that it has a, a, a wick tube um, that you can see best probably on the lower right um, that contains the wick better. So you tend to have less drippy, less dripping. Um, and then the, the reservoir underneath it receives any drips that do come off the wick. Um, you often have a, a attached pick wick which is metathesis when you change sounds around for a wick pick, but we tend to use the, the latter word. Um, and they came in a whole variety of materials. They do seem to have been developed sometime probably in the 16th or 17th century in um, the Germanic states. Um, of course, there was no nation of Germany until 1870, um, but um, they came in a variety of materials, oftentimes sheet metal, sheet iron, tin, copper, brass, and, uh, were, were an improvement on the old grease lamp because they were a little more convenient, less messy. And um, this is a better shot of, a, of the dripless wick support in one of them. I've got the arrow pointing to it. And you can see the lower left made of cheap tin plate as a chamber, a chamber lamp where you've got a, a extra support underneath to give the lamp stability, but also as an extra protection against any drips and a convenient finger hole to move it from room to room. One thing you'll often see in depictions of early lighting devices are rush lights. Rush is um, river rush, cattails, the stalk of cattails. It's a very fibrous material that is a wonderful wick. It can be soaked in grease, um, any kind of grease left over from the kitchen, and it will give a fair amount of light. And you see these in antique stores, you see them in museums. Um, Old Sturbridge Village has a number of them in our collection. You'll see them in our early lighting exhibit, but you won't see them in our homes because most scholars agree that um, while uh, these, these um, rush light burners, even though it's the symbol of the rush light club, are mostly British. Um, those that are found in America probably were imported during the um, colonial revival the late 19th through the 20th century um, time when Americans liked to decorate in an early American manner. And these things really uh, got brought over in large numbers from Great Britain. Um, there was a resurgence of their use during World War II um, when um, all kind, manner of supplies and fuel was in short supply in Britain. The rural areas went back to using rush lights for a while. But that's in Britain. There's there's very little, if any, evidence that they were widely used or even used at all much in early America. So we'll dismiss rush lights. Most early lighting came from candles, um, and most candles were made of tallow. Tallow is the fat of cattle and sheep. Um, it's much thicker at room temperature than the fat from pigs or chickens uh, or other creatures, um, and that's why it's better suited for candles. Um, you can make candles out of other materials, um, wax, spermaceti wax on the top, which is um, from the sperm whale, uh, which, which has a large, large uh, structure in its head. Um, 
full of this material, which is why they were so widely hunted in the uh, 18th and especially 19th centuries, um, even into the early 20th century, because um, sperm, uh, spermaceti, the, the material in their head, is a very clean, very bright burning fuel. Um, and the oil form of it is actually a liquid wax that is a, the highly superior lubricant. Another source of wax on the lower left are bayberries, which grow um, a lot in New England, especially along Cape Cod and other places are very waxy berry. Um, you gather these and you put them in a pot of hot water and you boil them until the wax dissolves and flows to the top of the water and then you let it cool and skim it off. But that's a lot of labor for a fairly small amount of wax. And another source of wax, of course, is beeswax. Um, but wax is a lot more expensive. A lot more work goes into gathering it than gathering tallow from uh, rendering the fat of sheep and cattle, which are widely raised on the grasslands of New England and um, a major part of the diet of early New Englanders as well. Making candles was a messy winter chore. Um, most reminiscences from the time uh, remember that, that, that mothers would pack their children off to school with, with, a, with a, uh, a portable dinner, what today we call lunch, and say, don't come back because the kitchen is going to be a mess. Because you basically put sand on the floor, spread out newspapers, and put the chairs back to back and have sticks with lots of wicks tied to them and just keep dipping them and dipping them and dipping them into hot fat, letting the cool air um, congeal the fat around the wick until after who knows how many dozen dips in the hot fat you've got it. They have how many dips does it take? That's the number one question when we make candles at Old Sturbridge Village that the public asks is how many dips does it take? The answer, of course, is enough until it's a big enough candle for you and your family. It depends on so many conditions, how hot the fat is, how cold the room is. Um, uh, it, it really varies. Um, I, I ask rhetorically, this is a picture from another historic site of a lady supposedly dipping candles, but I can't imagine anyone in these clothes squatting near a fire um, and, and dipping the candles could be incredibly uncomfortable. Probably not very safe either, but anyway. Um, if, you, if you need to make a lot of candles, which most New England families did, had to make several hundred, because you basically got a day or so in the winter that you make your candle supply for the year, dipping is the most efficient way to do it. Um, Candle molds, uh, basically tin plated iron tubes um, that you could make candles, use to make candles, um, were fairly common. Um, heaven knows we've got, we've got lots and lots in our collection. Um, they do show up in probate inventories with some regularity. Um, the nice thing about molded candles is that they're always uniform. Um, they're nice and straight. Um, they don't tend to be lumpy bumpy like dipped candles can be. And the other nice thing about molded candles is if you run out of candles in the year and you need to make some more, this is a good way to make a dozen or a couple dozen candles without putting up your whole kitchen to this big rigmarole candle dipping process. So that's another advantage of molded candles um, besides dipping them. Okay, there we go. And, and candles are also made on industrial scales in um, there were people called chandlers um, sometimes Chandler means a person that sells supplies to a sailing ship. Sometimes it means a candle maker. Um, and there were people that industrially dip candles. This actually is in a um, living history village in the British Midlands, um, where they showed industrial candle making in the 19th century with this kind of what I would call a Ferris wheel with the, uh, the multiple rods of, of wicks that just revolve around and around over a vat of hot fat and um, and get dipped. Actually, if you look at it carefully, the candles are all light green. This part of England was a mining district, uh, digging a lot of coal and iron and other things out of the ground. And of course, in the mines, they needed candles. And the, the mine companies would supply the miners with candles that were green. The reason they were green is they added poison to them so that rats and the, the, the poorly paid miners' families wouldn't be tempted to to use the fat of the candles as food. And they also dyed them green so that they were also green, not only from the poison, but that way if the um, mine owners peeked in the miners um, rented huts and saw the family using a mine company candle, they would dismiss the miner for pilfering 
candles from the mine. But that's neither here nor there, but my little side away. Wicks of candles matter. Um, it's not just any old uh, vegetable fiber. Cotton, linen were most widely used for candle wicks, although a number of other materials would work. One of the problems with wicks, though, is that um, they are outside, they're inside the flame. I'm going to go back, uh, or try to. Oh, golly. Well, maybe I can't go back. Um, you can't go back again. That's the old saying. Try one more time. There we go. You'll see that these wicks are inside the flame, which means that the, the, wick, the wick continues to burn, but because it's inside the flame, it burns down and down. The wick gets taller and taller as the, the tallow, the wax, whatever your candle's made out of melts. And so periodically the wicks have to be trimmed or, um, uh, or snipped or what they call snuffed. It's not putting it out. The snuffing is trimming it so the wick doesn't get too tall. So if the wick gets too tall, it falls over and then the candle gutters. It makes a big mess, melts all the fuel and uh, makes a huge mess of the candle. And so what they had for trimming the wicks, for snuffing the wicks, were these on the right, these specialized scissors with little catch boxes on them for catching the, um, the little bit of wick that you're trimming up that's gotten too long. The cone on the left is a candle extinguisher. That's meant for extinguishing, putting out the candle by depriving it of oxygen. Um, so there's a difference between snuffers and extinguishers. Extinguisher on the left, snuffers on the right. Um, in the early 19th century, I think it was 1811, um, the braided wick was invented. And if you braid three fibers together, like girls sometimes braid their hair, um, the, you can make one of those a little tighter and then the wick as it burns will bend. And you can see this candle here, the tip of the wick is glowing orange and it's a little bit out of the flame. By doing that, by having that self-trimming braided wick, the candle wick will burn away at about the same rate that the fuel will burn away and you don't have to use a snuffer or a jackknife to trim the wick periodically. About 20 years ago, I, um, I was in Romania in Eastern Europe and I attended a, um, a funeral for the local mayor of the little village that I was staying in. And um, they had a Romanian Orthodox service which involved dozens and dozens and dozens of candles. And one man's job for this two hour funeral service with, with, with his thumb and a jackknife was run from candle to candle and trim the wicks. Didn't even have a, a, a snuffer like this with a little catch box on it to do it. Um, but anyway, it, it shows that, that even though trimmed, uh, self trimming braided wicks have been around and pretty much the norm here in North America for a long time, at least into the uh, well, the late 1990s, they were still being used in Eastern Europe fairly regularly and un unbraided, I should say, wick, just plain straight candle wick. Anyhow, remember the candles are made out of food. They're made out of animal fat mostly. And of course, mice like to eat food, especially high calorie foods like fats, which is why we bait mouse traps with high calorie foods like peanut butter and, and, um, and cheese today. But um, so your candles, you wouldn't leave them out in your candlesticks and your sconces um, when they're not in use because that's just saying to the mice, come, come eat our, our lighting devices and leave your little um, feces all over the house. So when you're not using a candle in early America, you tended to take it out of the candle holder and put it in a candle safe. A nice box like this tin one here um, that you'd hang on the wall and, uh, and that's something that the uh, clever little rodents can't get into. So it's a good way to protect your candles. I probably should say before I move on that when you dip candles, you don't use them right away. They really need to age. Usually you let your candles age for, oh, at least six months or so, if not longer. Uh, it lets some of the more volatile um, hydrocarbons evaporate into the air and allows the candles to be a little harder and they last longer, they burn longer, they burn brighter. Um, for, for letting them age for a while. Um, sometimes you treat the wicks as well. You dip them in lime or other, or alum, and that lets them burn a little more slowly and also a little brighter um, than if you don't treat the wicks. But this is not gonna be a, 
an exhaustive primer on candle making. Um, like I said, there's there's a lot more here than we can cover in a quick talk. But anyway, um, one thing that was fairly common, if you look at probate inventories, the inventories they took of people's estates when they died to see what they had, which is a wonderful thing for we curators, if not for the poor people who passed away, because um, we know now what, what a lot of people had in their houses. And one very common thing was um, a candle stand, which are these little tables, like this one in the middle, that you could put a candle or a lamp on, almost always with three legs and a fairly fairly small top. But candle stands came in other forms, sometimes wooden, sometimes with a threaded rod that you could have used to rotate the, um, the candle holders up or down to regulate how high or low the light was in the room. And you could also do that with this um, iron one on the right. But most candles tended to go into candlesticks or wall sconces. Um, wall sconces at the top, candlesticks on the bottom. And um, candlesticks tended to be very, very common and made out of a wide variety of materials, um, pewter, um, brass, um, glass, sometimes plain, sometimes decorative. Um, styles varied over time. Very often by the um, 19th century, late 18th century, they tend to have a lot of uh, Greco-Roman influence. A lot of them tend to have look like Doric or Corinthian or other um, Greek columns. A lot of them are lathe turned like this and have a lot of um, decoration to them. But a lot of people you were using a very plain candlestick called the common hog, hog scraper candlestick. These were mass produced, especially in Birmingham, England out of sheet iron, um, just black iron as they call it at the day. Um, just uh, rolled into a tube, little little uh, candle ejector. That's what the little thumb thing is. You can push out your candle. They're called hog scrapers because they very much resemble, as you can see, the, the tool used for scraping the bristles off a freshly butchered pig, which is in the lower left of this slide. That's a hog scraper on the lower left. And then the candle sticks um, on the rest of the screen. Um, so this shows the hog scraper and hog scraper candlestick in use. Several antique hog scraper candlesticks have been found with bristles stuck, stuffed in, uh, stuck in little bits of them. So it seems that people not only had hog scrapers and sometimes used knives and other um, things to, to scrape the bristles off a freshly butchered pig, because unlike most animals, you don't skin a pig. The, the skin tends, tends, to, tends to stay on the creature, but you need to get the hairs off them. And so that what they you do when you butcher a pig is basically dip it in hot water to um, to loosen the hairs and then take it out and that's why all the steam is there and then scrape off the loosened bristles um, and a hog scraper or a hog scraper candlestick um, makes that that job go pretty quick anyhow. Um, but like I said, they were mostly made in the late 18th into the mid 19th century, mostly in Birmingham, England. Um, sometimes they're marked by their makers. Um, they're fairly, fairly cheap things, not very expensive, but as a result, very, very common. Something you'd find not in your, your best room if you had any money, but certainly in your, your kitchen, your back room, very utilitarian thing. Um, one thing that shows up at a lot of historic house museums that's uh, kind of a um, pet peeve of a lot of curators like myself are these spiral candlesticks. Um, they're, they're not very common. We have a few in our collection. You do see historic ones, but they tend to be something that, that blacksmiths in the 20th and into the 21st century often like to reproduce. Um, they're often called courting candlesticks. Um, I'm gonna tell you the myth and I hope you remember that it is a myth and not a real story. The problem with myths is they tend to grow and tend to stick because they're great stories and they great stories stick in our heads. Anyway, um, as you can see, especially on the one on the right, you can have a, a little base that rotates up this spiral to adjust how high up the candle is. Well, the myth, the story is they're courting candlesticks is that the, the father, when, you're, when somebody came to, to court his daughter, would adjust how high the candle was. And when the candle would burn down, then the, the suitor had to leave. And so if he liked the young man, he'd, he'd leave it nice and long so that he'd stay for a long time. And if he didn't like the young man, he'd make it real short so that the, the man would have to leave his daughter alone in fairly short order. 
but there's no substantiation for this. It's a great story, but it doesn't seem to have any basis in fact. Um, of course, you can't prove a negative, but there you go. Anyway, silver was something that was often used for candlesticks in better homes. Um, and even uh, upper middling homes would have at least some silver candlesticks, it seems, as a way to uh, store and display wealth. And of course, polished silver, like polished brass, also helps to reflect and spread the light and, um, and please the eye in a dimly lit room. Um, sconces on the walls were very often out of tin plate, um, thin sheets of iron plated with tin, of course, over several hundred years that tin tends to wear off or get tarnished, but they do tend to be reflective when they're new. Some of these sconces often had, uh, had little bits of mirrored glass in them. Um, I find these particularly attractive, like the one on the right. Um, and of course, with the mirrored glass, they were uh, reflecting a lot of light back into the room instead of letting it just be wasted on the wall. The other nice thing about sconces is they do keep any soot if there's a draft from getting on the wall. The sconce is certainly easier to clean than the wall. Um, and of course, chamber sticks were fairly common as well. Uh, your, your, the room you slept in was usually called a chamber, um, not a bedroom, um, usually named after the room below it. So if you're the room you slept in the kitchen chamber, if you slept over the parlor, it was the parlor chamber and so forth and so on. So anyway, when you went to bed at night, you'd often want to bring a little light with you for at least a while. And these um, chamber sticks with a nice stable base that also would catch any drips, because when you're moving, of course, the, uh, the, 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 the fuel, the tallow, the wax, what have you, will be more likely to drip. Um, so that's why you have the nice wide base and a nice little thing to hold it with, with your finger. And they like, uh-oh, what do they do? Let's try that. All right. I'm sorry, I don't know why the slide is not advancing. There we go. So here's a little, a little, another little quiz we have. How can one tell that this painted tin plate chamber stick is from roughly the 1850s? Um, I'll let you think about that for a second and I'll tell you some of the ways that I can tell is from the 1850s. For one thing, it's, it's um, stamped tin, tin parts. Rural tin smiths tended not to have stamped parts like this. Um, they tended to use flat sheets of tin, bend them, fold them, shape them. But usually they're, when using the stamp stuff, they're coming from stamping mills, from factories that are supplying tinners with partially made parts, kind of like um, automobile makers today um, often buy uh, sub-assemblies, if you will. They'll buy alternators and uh, fuel injector units and airbags and other things like that and incorporate them into their cars. And 19th century tinsmiths by the mid-1800s were very often buying some stamped, pre-formed parts and then putting them all together into the finished product. So that's one way we can tell it's from the mid-19th century. Another way is that um, over here by the handle, it's got a little holder for matches. And matches don't come along um, until the 18 teens, 20s, and they don't really get common until more closer to the 1840s and 50s. And so the fact that it has a match holder indicates that it's more mid 19th century than earlier. And of course, the real way you tell it's 18 from the 1850s, it's marked A. Rockwell, patent February 27, 1855. And he was making these things in Ridgefield, Connecticut. So that's my little joke. I apologize. Um, anyhow. Another form of lighting device that were very common were whale oil lamps. Of course, the whale oil industry was a huge industry in the United States in the 18th and especially the 19th century. And um, whale ships, especially from here in New England, New Bedford, New London, Nantucket, and other ports um, traveled ever farther away through the Atlantic and well into the Pacific and the Arctic seas in search of um, various species of whales for the um, abundant oil of fat that they, they had in their bodies. A uh, very dangerous um, job for men, a very tedious job for men. And of course it's uh, done harm to the whale populations that are still some species like the uh, 
right whale are still um, endangered as a result of that over, over harvesting in the 19th century. However, whale oil, while it was around, wasn't that was not that common. Here's this little chart that shows you that most light came from candles, mostly tallow candles, some wax, but mostly tallow candles. But whale oil light was something that was certainly around in the 1700s, um, but really started picking up in the 1800s. Um, and then in the mid 1800s fell off as the whales were over harvested. And people were still hunting whales for oil into the 20th century, but it was increasingly less profitable. Um, whale oil lamps have several distinguishing characteristics. They can be made out of a number of materials, just like the other things, out of glass, out of tin plate, out of pewter, out of brass, out of many materials. Um, and of course, you have two different kinds of whale oil. You have spermaceti oil, the very, very clear um, bright oil that comes out of the head of one species of whale, the sperm whale. But most whale oil was the fat, the blubber, the body fat that, that um, was around the bodies of, of many, many, many species of sea mammals. Um, and that was uh, peeled off and then cooked down on whale ships um, and put in casks and kegs and barrels and sent back to New England. Um, the distinguishing characteristics of whale oil lamps. How can you tell if you have a whale oil lamp? They tend to have long, what are called wick tubes. I don't know if my, my cursor shows up on the screen. Hopefully it will. The, um, the, these long tubes that go below the, um, the top and hold the wick and go into the reservoir. The idea is the heat from the flame would transmit down the metal tube into the oil and keep the oil more liquid and flow better into the into the into the flame and so long wick tubes are distinguishing characteristic of whale oil lamps they don't always have twin burners sometimes they have triple burners sometimes they're single burners but two flames burning next to each other are brighter for some reason than two flames that are separate from each other so whale oil lamps tend to have um, two or more burners together very common and always have wick tubes that go down into the, into the oil, into the reservoir that holds the fuel. The other thing about whale oil lamps is the reservoir, because whale oil is fairly expensive, the reservoirs tend to be fairly small, um, especially if you're used to kerosene lamps with larger reservoirs. Whale oil lamps tend to have smaller reservoirs and almost always have wick tubes and round wicks. Um, very often, another form of whale oil lamp or, or in other oil lamps, not just whale oil, were, were peg lamps, um, basically glass um, cylinder, uh, glass containers that could, could support a burner and also had a little peg at the bottom that could fit into a candlestick. So it was a good way of using your candlesticks when you went over to the brighter, um, cleaner, less convenient, uh, uh, more convenient, I should say, light of oil later in the 19th century, as oil became more popular from candles, you can still use your candlesticks. An improvement on the oil lamp was invented by a Franco-Swiss named Armi Argon. Armi, uh, it's not argon, the, the noble gas, which of course won't react with anything, but it's a man's name, uh, Marie Argon. Argon um, invented a tubular wick that let air not only flow to the outside of the wick, like a regular wick, but up through it. And that allowed the flame to be much, much brighter. Most people estimate the flame is about 10 times brighter by, by using a tubular wick than using um, just a, a plain round or flat wick. So it's a real, um, a real improvement. But again, it's Francois Pierre Armi Argon, not Argand. Um, I've heard people at some historic house museum say, oh, it's an argon lamp. No, it's not an argon lamp. It's an argon lamp. Um, so not the noble gas, atomic number 18, but a uh, Franco-Swiss. Anyway, um, and one thing that was popular, especially with argon lamps, oil lamps, were these what are called sinumbra lamps. Sin means without, umbra means shadow. So without shadow, it's got a round but hollow reservoir. In other words, there's nothing in the middle. It's just a circular reservoir. So the light can come down 
it's not blocked by the reservoir. So it can come down uh, onto a table and more throughout the room. And so these Sinumbra lamps were very, very popular for a while um, as chandeliers as well. A little more about whale oil. Um, this picture here of New Bedford, Massachusetts, one of the whale oil capitals. This is after the heyday of, the, of whaling, but it was still, as you can see, quite popular. Um, whale oil production peaked in the mid 1840s at over half a million barrels annually. Uh, oil barrels about 42 gallons, so that's a whole lot of oil. Um, however, when you work that out to the population of the United States, it's about a gallon of whale oil per person per year. Um, for anybody who's been to Old Sturbridge Village, we have a country store that was owned by, from Dummerston, Vermont, owned by a man named um, Asa Knight. And I went through Asa Knight's account books for 1835. And in 1835, he sold an average of a gallon a month to all his customers combined. Um, so like I said, most of your light is coming from natural sources, um, the sun, the moon, the stars, um, or tallow, although some of it is coming from oil, whale oil. I think, I can't prove it. Um, I don't know of any studies that have that oil is probably a little more common in urban areas than in rural areas, but I do not know that. But of course, most Americans by far in the 19th century lived in rural areas. Um, because of the over harvesting of the whales, um, and growing populations and growing wealth, there was an increasing shortage of whale oil. And so a lot of substitute lamp fuels were developed. One was called burning fluid. Burning fluid is a mixture of alcohol and turpentine. Um, and that gave a very clean, bright flame. It burned very quickly, very easily, um, but it could also overheat a lamp and cause it to explode. Um, that's why I have the little gravestone here of Ellen Shannon, as you can see, was fatally burned um, by an explosion of a lamp filled with um, R.E. Danforth's non-explosive burning fluid. So burning fluid was a very dangerous material that you're always seeing in the 19th century. Um, horrific newspaper uh, reports of people burned by lamps. Burning fluid, because it was so combustible, um, burned so readily, burned too well, that if you burned it in a whale oil lamp, you were sorry. That's probably what the young lady who died was doing. Lamps designed for using burning fluid differed from whale oil lamps. They tended to separate the, the, the wick tubes so that the flames were independent. They didn't burn together, which generated less heat, which made the lamp cooler. Another distinguishing factor is you don't have the wick tubes going down into the reservoir because alcohol and turpentine are so very volatile, they don't need to be warmed to, to feed the flame. The other thing is the wick tubes tend to be very high above the lamp to get the heat away from the reservoirs when you're using burning fluid. And again, like the whale oil lamps, the burning fluid lamps tend to have fairly small reservoirs compared to later kerosene lamps. Another fuel was lard oil. Um, pigs were the number one source of protein in people's diets in 19th century America. America then ate more pork than anything else. Um, yeah, beef was second. Um, fowl was a very distant, a distant in the past and uh, low on the list. It's an awful lot of work to butcher a chicken um, for the amount of meat you get compared to butchering a large animal like a pig, which is a, also a very efficient animal at turning waste products and whatever they can scrounge into meat. But regardless of that, so the oil from pigs was another uh, fuel by the mid 19th century that was increasingly turned to for, um, for, for light. Um, this is a, a patent um, lard oil lamp from the 1850s. It's got a piston on it because the lard oil, um, which is expressed from lard, you don't, don't render it like you would bacon fat. You actually squeeze a piece of pig fat and get the thinner, lighter oil out of it. Um, but it still tends to be thicker than whale oil, thicker than, um, than certainly alcohol, turpentine, burning fluid, these kind of things. And so very often they have pistons you push down on to force the fuel up into the, into the flame. Um, sometimes, oh, here, here's, here's the happy pig that's 
um, providing the, the lardo. But you see a lot of these things like this here, just a couple boards hinged together or this more complicated thing for expressing, they call it, squeezing the lard oil out of lard, out of the, the fat of a swine. Um, but anyway, um, like I said, lard oil was, was, was increasingly used in the mid 1800s. Um, it, it was something we could certainly make here in the United States. We didn't have to send ships to the other side of the planet to find it like they did for whale oil, um, but it was very, very thick. And so very often they'll have wider wicks to produce more heat. They tend to go all the way down into the, even more so than whale oil to heat the fuel um, and keep the, the reservoir fairly narrow to keep the, the heat in. Um, there's a lot of patents for um, lard, lard lamps, but they almost always have these lar long, long tubes that go down into the reservoir. And they tend to use bigger wicks and flatter wicks to generate more heat and somewhat more light from an inferior fuel. Um, but there's many other ways they came up besides the pistons of getting the, uh, the fuel in. Oftentimes they tilt like this one here to get, um, they'd oftentimes have multiple wicks like this one here to get more heat generated to keep the fuel flowing. One of my favorite patents is this one by um, Swope, which takes the heat from the flame catches the, the, the hot gas from the flame and then feeds it down through a tube through the hot oil, through the lard oil, and then up and exhausts it next to the flame. So it's taking the exhaust gas and using it to keep the, the fuel hot. Creative idea. Um, a lot of lard oil, lard oil lamps were made here in New England um, in inexpensive tin, sometimes better materials like brass, pewter, glass, but um, a lot of New Englanders were manufacturing. It does not seem to have been widely used in New England, though. It tends to be um, something that the oil lamps were being made for lard oil lamps here in New England, and then they're shipped to the Midwestern states, um, where they've got a lot more pigs and, uh, and uh, are, are farther from the coast to get whale oil. Um, another form of artificial light fuel was what was called coal gas. Um, which they were using in London and by the 18 teens in Newport, Rhode Island, Baltimore, Maryland. Um, basically, if you heat coal, by especially bituminous coal, soft coal, um, you drive off volatile gases, which are are gaseous, not liquid, and become very and are very volatile and can burn with a nice, bright, clean flame. What's left behind is a material called coke. If you've seen blacksmithing at living history sites, including Old Sturbridge Village, you might notice that the blacksmith's fire has flame coming off. That's the coal gas burning off. And what's left behind to glow and burn in the fire is the solid carbon. That's the coke. Um, in Britain, they would take the coal, burn the coal into coke, use the coke to make iron and steel. And then the gas they would um, put through pipes into into oil lamps um, on streets initially and eventually into homes. Um, but it is mostly as a result an urban phenomena, not something that's really practical in rural areas. Um, and cities by the 18 teens, big cities like London and Baltimore and Philadelphia and uh, would have gas plants where they would basically heat the coal and capture the volatile gas and sell that. Anyhow, moving on. Um, Coal oil, uh, kerosene, was something else that became um, available in the mid 19th century. Um, initially, it was made by um, refining coal, deriving this liquid that burned um, by cooking coal. Um, but eventually, they figured out very quickly, they figured out they could also get it from kerosene, uh, excuse me, from petroleum. And uh, um, a sofa pan of Colonel, he was never a military figure, but this guy here. Edwin Drake, he called himself Colonel, like Colonel Sanders was never really a military officer. Um, a lot of people like to call themselves Colonel. Anyway, um, Elvis's uh, manager, Colonel Parker, um, none of them were colonels. Anyhow, Edwin Drake in uh, 1859 in Titusville, Pennsylvania, drilled the first successful whale, uh, oil, oil well. Um, of course, there's plenty of places on the planet, especially in the Crimea, um, where oil just seeps to the surface. Um, but uh, he was able to find it in Pennsylvania and make 
uh, lamp fuel, kerosene, out of it. There's a myth, another myth I'll spread um, or debunk, hopefully, is that, um, is that kerosene was discovered because people, um, it was discovered to, to right at the same time that we ran out of oil from whales. Um, but as you can see by this chart of whale oil production, whale oil production peaked well before, several decades before kerosene production really took over. So in fact, whale oil production had peaked long before kerosene was really even on the market. Um, and so uh, that's, that's something that uh, whale oil was eventually replaced by kerosene, but it wasn't as neat and tidy as some people would like. Kerosene lamps come in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of styles. Um, some for brighter flame, some for stylistic reasons, um, some for convenience reasons. But most variations besides style um, involve how the air gets to the flame and feeds the flame and makes a brighter flame. Um, because of course, more, more light is the, uh, is the ultimate goal. Um, but like I said, style um, is another factor. Kerosene lamps like the, like the lard oil lamps tend to have flat wicks, um, although some variations on other wick shapes. Um, oftentimes people like to know about cost. How much does it cost? What does it cost? And how much of a factor are these fuels in, um, in these things? I picked the year 1855 because you've got all the fuels in wide use in that year. Um, and you can see here, this is 1855 prices, but whale oil varies depending on quality, um, quite a bit. Camphene, one of these uh, alternate burning uh, burning fluids that I didn't really talk about a lot, is uh, a lot cheaper than whale oil, which is one reason why for a few years or a few decades in the mid 19th century, these alternate fuels were so widely used, even though they um, were uh, had other issues, including danger and uh, smell. Uh, lard oil was fairly cheap, um, but it really smelled like you were in um, uh, somebody who's cooking bacon all the time. Um, and uh, coal oil, kerosene, was very cheap. Um, initially, it was made, like I said, from coal, not from uh, petroleum. But um, it was, it tended to be sooty, it smelled, it was low quality. And, uh, and candles uh, were increasingly more rural and low income in the cities, but they were very cheap. Um, Although the spermaceti candles, the ones made from the high quality wax from the sperm whale were much more expensive. So, you know, all these things were alternatives on the market and people, you know, had to balance between the kind of lamps they had, between their own preferences, their how much risk they wanted to take and how much money they wanted to spend and the quality of light they wanted to generate. And of course, people needed lighting, not just in their homes, but to get out of their homes, out to the barn. Um, very often lanterns were pierced tin like this. The advantage of pierced or punched tin, sometimes they're uh, sheet copper or other materials, is that these lamps were unbreakable. You don't have glass that can shatter. Um, and because the metal was punched, holes were poked through it from what's, when it's put together from the inside out, it tends to deflect breezes. So these lanterns, when the door is closed, are impossible to blow out. Um, it's a little trick that our tinner, tinsmiths at Old Sturbridge Village sometimes do with kids. You know, we'll light a lantern and then close the door and challenge them to blow out the candle. And you know, they, they blow and blow and blow and they just can't do it. And then we say, well, I'll show you how. You open the door and you blow out the candle. But um, anyhow, um, these pierced lanterns are good for that. And of course, if you get into a place where there's not a breeze, like you walked out to your barn, you can open the door and let more light out. But they do send a surprising amount of light through just the piercings. And they've been widely used. I'd love this, how this little tin lantern peddler in Paris in the mid 1700s is so surprised that somebody's drawing his picture. But anyhow, um, they were around for hundreds of years, the pierced tin lanterns, um, and were very widely used. Um, glazed lanterns, which means they have glass in them, 
were also fairly widely used and came in a wide, wide, wide variety of styles. Um, of course, the disadvantage of glass is that it's expensive and it's very fragile. It can break, um, but uh, of course it's translucent. So it's um, a better lantern. Horn was used, animal horn, um, shaved thin, uh, boiled and pressed into flat or curved um, pieces was, was used. It's less brittle than glass. It's less translucent, but still lets a lot of light through it was fairly widely used, especially in the 18th and into the 19th century for lanterns. Um, there's another myth that sometimes people circulate is that, that, that they're called lanterns because it's lant horn um, because of the horn used in the, uh, the, the glazing of the lamp, but that's not it. Of course, lanterna is the Latin word for light. And so that's why we call these portable sources of light lanterns. It doesn't have anything to do with this idea that they had horn in them, but that's another myth you'll sometimes hear at historic house museums. Um, and of course, some lanterns didn't just have a candle in it, but they had an oil lamp in it, which is really just a way of carrying around your oil lamp. Um, again, if you're not burning kerosene, very small reservoirs. Kerosene is cheaper though, until they do tend to have bigger reservoirs. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot into this, but uh, there are a lot of ways to get the kerosene brighter. I'm um, just having a, uh, a wick without any particular way, but whatever air gets to it, and it's called a dead wick. Um, in the 1860s, they came up with a cold blast lantern that took, excuse me, the hot blast lantern that took the exhaust gas from the, um, from the flame and then fed it back through the flame to try to pull more air through the flame. Of course, you know, fire needs two things. It needs fuel and it needs oxygen. And the more oxygen, the more air you give the flame, the faster, the hotter and the brighter. Uh, the flame will be. Um, and by 1880, as we saw at the beginning of the talk, they came up with a coal blast lantern that um, would use the heated exhaust gas to, instead of taking the depleted oxygen exhaust gas, but pull fresh air um, into the flame and make it very bright, which is the, the Dietz lantern that we still see still available today. I quite frankly have two of them hanging on my front porch right now. Um, it's a very nice lantern. Um, and uh, the Deeds Company still makes them. Um, there's a lot of imitators as well since the patent ran out long ago. And uh, even the Deeds Company has made them in China since the 1950s. So anyhow, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap this up because I know I've been nattering on at you for a while. But one last thought, um, you know, if, if it's your own house, of course you can decorate your house however you like, but um, I give advice to people uh, furnishing historic house museums um, I point out that with that when you're depicting a home, you know, look at, like I said at the beginning, not only do you find a, a light source that fits the time and place and economic status of the household you're portraying, but also remember that um, you're depicting, they're depicting a home where very often people would crowd around a source of light. But he remembers even the movie Gone with the Wind. Um, you know, they all crowded around a, a lamp while Melanie read a book to them. I think Dickens, while the Rhett and, and the other men were out on a Ku Klux Klan raid or some such nefarious thing. But a lot of historic housing museums overdo the light in a room. Um, instead of having one lamp or one candle in the middle of a table and people crowding around it or taking advantage of the fireplace, um, they tend to uh, overdo it. So 19th century people went toward the light instead of trying to suffuse the room with light they went where they needed the light or brought the light where they needed it um, because they're depicting a home, not a votive shrine. Very often, some historic house museums, you know, especially if they do a nighttime program, have candles everywhere, which is very anachronistic. Um, but that's why I like this. I like our evening of illumination program at Old Sturbridge Village is we have minimal light levels. And it's interesting uh, that people see that. Maybe we don't just try to make it like a modern room with a lot of light. Anyway, so usually one lamp will suffice quite nicely for reading, for fine work. Um, and so I'd like to say good night. Of course, usually in the um, in pre-COVID times, we could do a little question and answer right now, but I don't know if Chris or Eric or Paul, any of you have questions, I could try to address them, but otherwise, I thank you for having me on and um,
and hope that uh, our viewers are enjoying this and uh, and um, and uh, it, if you if you really feel the, the need to ask questions, I don't know if I can answer them all, but I'll give you my email address. It's T K E L L E H E R at symbol and then O S V for old Sturbridge Village dot O R G. I hope I don't regret that, but <laughs> thank you very much for having me on. Well, thank you very much, Tom, for coming. Um, Always a pleasure. Great. On November 18th, meaning will be Short Skirts Oh My by Ann Barrett. This lecture traces the exciting historical milestones and the fight for women's rights. We hope to see you in. See you in November.